Hello and welcome to this special Social Sciences Week event, the Life Course Centre Looking Back, Looking Forward. I'm Mark Weston and I'm the Director of the Institute for Social Science Research here at the University of Queensland. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and their custodianship of all the lands on which we meet today. On behalf of the Institute for Social Science Research and the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Children and Families over the life course, I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable uh, contributions to Australian and global society. I would also like to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here today. As we meet today, more than 1 million Australians experience deep and persistent social and economic disadvantage. This disadvantage denies them opportunities that many of us take for granted. It prevents them from living the kinds of lives that they might otherwise choose. And it has significant social and economic costs for the country as a whole. In 2014, researchers at the Institute for Social Science Research here at the University of Queensland, along with leading researchers from other Australian and international universities, government partners, and partners in the not-for-profit sector, successfully secured funding from the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence to establish the Centre of Excellence for Children and Families over the Life Course. The Life Course Centre exists to help address deep and persistent disadvantage. Last year, we were again successful in securing another seven years of funding through the ARC to begin in 2021. The Life Course Centre was the only existing centre in the last funding round to win another round of funding. And their success speaks to the scientific and policy impact of the issues that the centre addresses and the excellence of the centre's team. The Life Course Centre is led by Professor Janine Baxter, who in addition to directing the centre is a group leader in the Institute for Social Science Research. Janine is a sociologist by training an internationally renowned researcher in topics relating to social disadvantage, gender inequality, family dynamics, and life course and longitudinal studies. She is an elected fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia and a member of the Council for the Committee for the Economic Development in Australia, amongst her many other roles. Janine is going to talk to us today about the Life Course Centre, looking back, looking forward. She will speak for about 30 minutes and we will then be able to take questions. You can submit your questions at any time through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please do so uh, whenever you have a question and we will try to get to as many as possible. I'll now hand over to Janine, thank you. Well, thanks very much, Mark, and thank you everybody for being here. Uh, this is my first webinar um, and I'm looking at myself, which is a very weird way to present a seminar. So <laughs> forgive me if there's a, a few hiccups along the way, but I hope there won't be. So I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet and pay my, respect to their, my respects to their ancestors and their descendants. It's great to be here speaking to you in Social Sciences Week, um, and it's always a pleasure to talk about the Life Course Centre. Um, as Mark said, um, there are about 1 million adults and children in Australia today experiencing deep and persistent disadvantage. Um, and we know that if we fail to do something about that, um, that they will continue to uh, experience social, iso social isolation and lock, lack of opportunities going forward. And not only do they experience isolation and lack of opportunities, but we know that the whole of society um, is affected um, by this issue. So what we see, and if we look at other societies around the world, the fragmentation and the divisions that come from this kind of social disadvantage affect everybody and not just those living in poverty. Um, by deep uh, disadvantage, what we mean is people who experience more than one form of social disadvantage, so economic disadvantage, social isolation, health disadvantage. And by persistent disadvantage, we mean people who experience disadvantage for a long period of time, often, sev often several years. 
and they're the group that we're particularly interested in in the Life Course Centre. And of course, what's happened in 2020 with COVID-19 has deepened um, the risks um, for, for these people and, and for new groups of people who haven't experienced disadvantage before. So what's going on in terms of COVID-19 is really making our centre, I think, even more important and the questions that we're addressing um, that much more urgent. So what I thought I would try to do in um, the 30 or so minutes that I have today is to start off, first of all, by telling you something about what a centre of excellence is. As Mark said, we are funded by the Australian Research Council. That brings a lot of opportunities, but also some responsibilities. So I'll talk very briefly about what a centre of excellence um, aims to do. Secondly, then, I'll focus a little bit on uh, what we've done in the current centre. So Centres of Excellence provide seven years of funding. We were funded in 2014. We're in our final year of funding now for the current centre. So I'll highlight the approach that we took and some of our key findings. And thirdly, what I'll do is talk about where we're going next. And again, as Mark said, we were very fortunate to receive another round of seven years of funding from the ARC and that new funding will commence in 2021. So I'll give you a, a taster of what we're planning um, to do and where we're going with the centre in the next few years. Okay, so first of all, um, what is an ARC Centre of Excellence? Well, it's a very prestigious um, collaborative um, endeavour to support outstanding research um, and develop Australia's international standing in research areas of, of national priority. Um, what we are aiming to do, of course, is to undertake innovative and transformational research. It gives us an opportunity to link researchers across the country and both within and outside academia and to build new capacity. Centres of Excellence also have to work on very large scale problems. So these are complex, um, some might refer to them as wicked problems that you cannot address with a, a single discovery or linkage grant that might only provide funding for you know, three or four years. Centres of Excellence also are designed to build new relationships and new networks, both nationally and internationally. And importantly, um, to develop the next generation of research leaders, both at the postgraduate and the postdoctoral um, level. And to have some kind of impact. So in addition to researching and trying to understand what is driving um, and what underlies deep and persistent disadvantage, we've been working very hard to reduce it um, and to have impact either through policy advice to our government partners or by designing new programs and interventions that might um, support um, those living in disadvantage. Next slide, please, Emily. So we were established in 2014. Um, we were very proud um, that at the time of that award, we were only the second uh, social science um, seven year centre of excellence to be funded by the ARC. Typically, the funding goes to the natural sciences. So we were very proud to, to receive the funding. Um, and we stood proudly alongside the only other um, social science centre, which is led by Professor John Piggott at University of New South Wales which is the Centre of Excellence for Population and Ageing Research. Um, and they too have been um, refunded a few years ago and are continuing. Um, and as I said, we were refunded um, and we'll commence our new centre uh, next year. Um, and we're a partner, uh, we're partnered across four universities. We're led out of the Institute for Social Science Research, uh, directed by Mark. Um, but we're a collaboration across four universities, so Queensland, Melbourne, Sydney and University of Western Australia. And in addition, we've established partnerships with a whole range of government and non-government organisations and international uh, universities. So we're quite a big centre and as I'll outline a bit later, in our, our new centre commencing next year, we've grown even larger. 
Uh, next slide, please. Emily. So I'll just say something very briefly about the life course approach, because this is, I think, the, the, uh, the approach or the framework that binds us all together, those of us in the centre. We're, we're a multidisciplinary centre comprising researchers from a whole range of different disciplines. But at our core, we all largely adhere to a life course approach. And what we mean by that is um, we're interested in understanding the way in which disadvantage develops and accrues at particular life course stages. We don't focus on a particular stage, although a lot of research, including our own, shows that the early years are very important for how people's life courses develop over time and the opportunities that they have when they're adults. Um, the other important part about a life course approach is that it typically requires longitudinal data. And that's data that follows people over time, interviewing them either every year or every couple of years to track and follow how their lives are unfolding um, across the life course. The other important part of a life course approach is that although we're interested and understand that people have agency and make decisions about um, their life courses, that they do so within a framework or a context that really shapes the opportunities available to them. And on this slide, you can see that we've highlighted some prompts and facilitators, as well as some constraints that people face across their life course. So families, communities, um, society, um, schooling, forming relationships, um, securing a job, are all the um, stages that people might go through that, that support them um, to pursue opportunities that they wish to um, uh, undertake. But there are also constraints that people face in those contexts, which are beyond their control. Um, some of the research that we've done, and I'll talk a bit about later, that if um, parents divorce or relationships break down, that that can have an effect not only on those adults, but also on children. Um, there are health effects um, that, that impact people's opportunities. There's also broader um, societal um, forces like unemployment levels, um, industry closures, that will affect um, how people's lives unfold. And they're typically outside an individual's control, but have a big impact on the opportunities that they, that they have access to. And of course, COVID-19 in 2020 is um, an enormous global contextual factor that's going to be shaping all of our life courses going forward. And so certainly any research that we do in the future that looks at what's going on in terms of opportunities and uh, disadvantage in 2020 and beyond, we'll need to take account of the impact of COVID-19. And so that's just one very critical contextual factor that's going to shape life courses going forward. Uh, next slide, thanks, Emily. So the vision in our, um, in our centre, uh, sorry, if we missed a slide there, Emily? Could we just go back one? Thank you. Um, so our vision then is to deliver transformative research, but importantly, to undertake research translation, to break um, the cycle of deep and persistent disadvantage. So we're informed by a life course theory. Uh, we work across diverse disciplines. And we're aiming to develop, um, to, sorry, to identify the drivers of deep and persistent disadvantage, develop and drive new solutions, build capacity, both within uh, academia in terms of our junior and mid-career researchers, but also in governments and our partner organisations, develop new data and technical infrastructure that will support social sciences more broadly in Australia, and strengthen collaborations between universities uh, and external agencies. Next slide, thanks. So what have we achieved in uh, the current centre? Well, we've been 
I'm proud to say enormously successful. We've produced um, over 800 um, research outputs. We've um, established a, a large critical mass of researchers and affiliates, both within academia and outside. And we've, as I said, very pleased that the ARC has recognised um, uh, these successes and have funded us going forward. The, the New Life Course Centre will focus on some of the same issues. Um, understanding deep and persistent disadvantage is not an easy um, problem to solve. Um, we know that, for example, that disadvantage is not random. We know it's dynamic. Um, and COVID-19 um, is a new um, uh, issue that, that will drive a lot of the research that I imagine we'll be doing over the next seven years. Uh, we know disadvantage is multidimensional. Um, so we're not just focusing on economic disadvantage, we're focusing on health, um, social disadvantage, um, locational and geographical disadvantage. We know that disadvantage is accumulated and correlated so that if you experience one form of disadvantage, you're more likely to experience other forms. And we know that it varies across social groups. So there are certain social groups, um, people who are at risk, who are more likely to experience disadvantage um, than others. So the playing field is not level for all Australian families um, and children. Next slide, thanks. So let me just highlight um, then a couple of key findings from the current centre. And I'm just going to pick uh, on three. Um, as you saw on that previous slide, we've, we've produced um, a lot of research. And if you're interested in finding out more about what we've done in the current centre, um, I'd encourage you to have a look at our website where we have uh, a working paper series um, and links to all of our research outputs um, and our impact. So um, one finding um, led, and this is work led by uh, Deborah Cobb-Clark and colleagues at the University of Sydney and University of Melbourne, has been using um, government administrative data to look at the uh, correlation between um, experiencing uh, being brought up in a family where your parents are on welfare and the impact of that on whether or not you are on welfare when you become an adult. Um, it's, this was quite a big research project. I can't um, summarise it all here in one slide and I've put a reference there to um, the paper. Um, so what they've done is to use government administrative data from Department of Social Services and what they found is that young people aged 18 to 26 years, if they were brought up in a family where their parents were receiving income support, that they're almost twice as likely to need social assistance or welfare support themselves when they're adults. And the figure is 1.8 times likely. And they further they were able to break it down by the kind of welfare that the parents had been receiving and they found that the link was strongest or the correlation was strongest for um, people brought up um, in single parent families who were receiving single parent payment, disability and carer payments, where the correlation was 1.6 times higher compared to individuals brought up um, where their parents were receiving parenting payment or unemployment, where the, where the, the correlation was about 1.3 or 1.4 times higher. Now, this was the first time in Australia that this research had ever been done. We knew that there was a link, uh, likely a link between parental welfare um, support and, and children's outcomes. But this was the first time that it had been shown empirically um, using, using the data. And in the paper, they talk through um, some of the potential pathways uh, between um, parents and children that might lead to this, these correlations. Um, and it could be a range of things that they talk about, um, just the fact that um, if you're brought up in a, a family where parents are on welfare, that you'll be um, likely experiencing economic disadvantage. But there may also be other factors in terms of 
your future orientation to work, um, your attitudes to work, your orientation to, um, to careers and pathways out of welfare assistance. So that was one key finding. That's um, research that's been highly influential um, and has been cited repeatedly in a number of government reports um, and inquiries. Uh, next slide, thanks Emily. Another area that we've focused on quite a bit in the current centre is the early years. And we're certainly not the first to point out that what happens in early years of one's life in terms of education will affect later opportunities. Uh, but this work has been led by our Deputy Director, Steve Zubrick from the Telethon Kids Institute in Western Australia and colleagues there. And they've used data from the Longitudinal Study of Australian Children, which is a, an ongoing longitudinal survey of children growing up in Australia, to look at the percentage of children who start school developmentally disadvantaged and how that then plays out over their life course. And as with the previous um, findings, the research, the, the, the findings were quite startling. So what they show is that almost 40% of children in Australia start school developmentally disadvantaged. Um, that's a much higher percentage um, than, than was expected. By developmentally disadvantaged, what they mean is that the children score below average on one or more indicators um, of things like nonverbal intelligence, uh, vocabulary, um, school readiness, behavioural problems, um, task attentiveness. Um, and uh, so 40% or 38 to be precise, 38% of children in Australia start school um, with one of those risk, risk factors. So starting behind, behind the um, average um, starting level. And what they've further shown is that of the 62% who are developmentally enabled and with low risk, they proceed through school and do well um, on, a, on an ongoing basis. But the 38% who don't, who start behind, behind, already behind at this critical life course stage, continue to lose ground over time. And so if, if the, the gaps haven't been addressed by about the time the children reach grade four, it's very, very difficult um, to close the gap. And so what that means and what they've shown is the gap in fact gets wider as children move through school. So that by the time these children leave school, they're well behind um, their peers. Um, and what, of course, that means is that they're less likely to pursue higher education, less likely to find a job, um, less likely to have access to the resources that will enable them to pursue the opportunities that others have. So again, this was a critical um, finding. It, the paper's been published um, and it's uh, another of our uh, research pieces that has had enormous impact um, uh, in terms of um, understanding where we need to focus our resources and what we need to do in those early years to ensure that we get that, that percentage down um, from 40%. Uh, next, next slide, thanks. Um, and then the third area that I wanted to highlight, um, and this is an area that I've done a lot of work in over the last few years around family dynamics, is looking at what happens when families don't work well, uh, both for children and adults. And we've done a wealth of research um, in this area and uh, colleagues and I will be bringing some of this research together into a monograph that, we've, um, that we'll be publishing with Springer in the next couple of years. But I just highlight two, um, two findings here. Some of the work we've done has looked at wealth, um, wealth outcomes as a result of relationship breakdown. A lot of research on family dynamics has focused on employment or earnings, but we've, we've looked at wealth 
um, which hasn't been so well researched. And what we've found here um, in a paper with my colleague Philip Lersch from Berlin, we've used data from the Household Income and Labor Dynamics in Australia survey to show that if you experience uh, divorce as a child, so if your parents divorce when you're a child, um, what, what that culminates in, what that means is that when you reach adulthood, you will have significantly less wealth in terms of home, home equity and assets than your counterparts who did not experience divorce. Um, and so this is quite a, a long-term impact. Um, so experiencing, if your parents divorce when you're between three and 15 years of age, we see this very clear pattern of these people growing up to hold less wealth. And we've um, looked at, you know, what are, the, what are the pathways, what are the mechanisms leading to this um, association? and found that it's to do with reduced education, unstable family structures, meaning that there's less likely to be a transfer of funding from parents to children, and less future-oriented time preferences. So experiencing that kind of relationship breakdown does impact how um, children uh, orient themselves and their future-oriented time preferences. With one of my PhD students, Nicole Capel, who's also now based in Berlin, we've also used longitudinal data from a German study to look at the impact of relationship breakdown on the wealth of adults going through that breakdown. And we were able with our longitudinal data to look at um, the couples three years prior to separation, and we followed them for 15 years after, after the divorce. Interestingly, we found, yes, um, there was a big decline in wealth for both men and women, but the gender differences were not as large as we expected. So both men and women experienced significant wealth declines as a result of divorce. And um, unsurprisingly, they were mainly driven by declines in housing wealth. We also found that the, the biggest decline um, occurred at separation. And there was very little decline um, as a result of going through a, a legal divorce. So the costs of the divorce didn't really impact on wealth levels. The, the, big, the big driver was um, uh, the decline in housing wealth, and that happened at the time of separation. So that by the time of divorce, both men and women were already starting to recover their wealth levels. Uh, we've just published that um, paper in Journal of Marriage and Family, um, and Nicole, I'm pleased to say, has completed her PhD and it's under examination, and I'm sure she'll be publishing more um, research from that um, thesis over the next few years. So next slide, thanks, Emily. Um, as I said, we've tried to translate our findings. So we have published a lot of academic papers, but we can also look back on the centre and point to um, important impact um, that we've had where we've been able to communicate our findings beyond academic journals. Um, and we've done this in a number of ways and our communications officer, uh, Matt McDermott, um, has been instrumental in helping us do this. Um, one of the ways we've done this is to really focus on making submissions to to government inquiries and we um, were very pleased to be invited to not only submit but to um, speak in person to the House of Representatives inquiry into intergenerational welfare dependence which um, took place a couple of years ago uh, and when the report came out um, we were very pleased to see an entire chapter devoted to life course recommendations. Another way that we've had impact looking back is through negotiating access to the wealth of administrative data that governments and other agencies collect. Um, these are data sets which are not collected for research purposes, but they're data which is collected as people, for example, move on and off welfare, the forms that they fill out, 
um, plus other forms of, of administrative data. They haven't been widely used for research, but we've worked really hard with others to access the data and to show what can be um, gleaned from the data in terms of research insights and policy advice. And we've worked very closely, for example, with the new Office of the National Data Commissioner, um, which is in PMNC, um, and which is um, working on opening and changing legislation to make that data um, accessible um, across the full range of the social science community. So that's just a, a smattering of some of the impact that we would highlight um, looking back on the current centre. Uh, so next slide, please. So moving on then to looking at where we're going next. Um, so what can we do next? Um, to get refunded through the Centre of Excellence scheme, we were not able to simply say, we want to do more of the same um, and please give us more money to continue researching what we've been researching. We really had to show how we were going to um, take what we had learned and move forward in important ways. Um, so we really want to, to um, shift the dial. And so what we've done with our new centre, which will commence next year, is to bring together new people, new, um, new disciplines, and importantly, to move outside um, the social science boundaries to bring in new disciplines and to move beyond um, averages to look at particular places. So next slide, please, Emily. One of the things that we'll do in our new centre, in, in the current centre, we've spent a lot of our, a lot of the emphasis has been on existing data, uh, national level data, looking at um, average outcomes for average people. Um, using data sources like HILDA, LSAC um, and others. But, but we know there's no such thing as an average person. And we know that policies designed um, to address the average person don't work because people live in sp specific circumstances, there are particular contexts. So we really wanna move beyond the averages to focus on particular places. And we want to move to new data um, uh, which is naturally occurring data. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. And also to bring in new disciplines. So moving outside the social science boundaries to bring in new, um, new expertise that can really help us um, tackle um, this problem. The next slide, please, Emily. So in the new center, we've defined three broad research programs, people, places and opportunities. Um, and the place-based work that we're planning, I think is one of the, the new um, directions that we'll, that we'll be moving to in the new centre, where we really hone in on what's going on in particular contexts and particular environments um, and uh, people living in specific circumstances. So people, places and opportunities, um, are the, the themes that, that we or the programs that we'll look at. Uh, next slide, please. And within each of these um, broad programs, we've outlined a number of areas that we're going to focus on. So the cognitive science of disadvantage uh, will be le work um, led primarily out of University of Sydney, which will look at how the stress of living in disadvantage affects the kinds of decisions um, uh, and the risk behaviours of particular um, people. Uh, financial choices through the life course will be work uh, that we will lead um, with one of our new partners, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, where we will look at how uh, people make financial choices and um, their attitudes and behaviours around financial transactions. Social determinants of sleep will be led um, uh, by Simon Smith, one of our new CIs here at uh, University of Queensland, 
and that will be using um, naturally occurring data from actigraph um, uh, that, that people um, will wear to look at how sleep and circadian functions influence social disadvantage and are, uh, are provide insight into um, the determinants of disadvantage. Uh, in places, we'll be looking, this is where we'll be doing our place-based research. Um, and we've got a number of uh, projects here looking at how place-based um, and community um, level um, disadvantage affects people's uh, readiness and resistance to disadvantage. We'll be doing some work on environmental conditions and how particular um, suburb level support influences child um, outcomes and development and looking at local service um, integration um, and the experiences um, for how we can design specific community um, led social support services for, for groups. In opportunities, um, we've got a number of projects. One is a longitudinal study of life opportunities, which we'll be building on work that I'm leading at the moment in ISSR, looking at uh, outcomes of the Try, Test and Learn innovations. Uh, Karen Thorpe, um, one of our CIs here at UQ, will be leading our work on education investments, focusing in particular on the early years and we'll be continuing our work on enduring family factors looking at how family dynamics um, improve or worsen life outcomes for for men women and children next slide thanks emily another innovation in the new center um, is that we'll be moving beyond the traditional social surveys that we focus on in the current survey in the current centre to bring in new forms of data. Um, so we'll be undertaking some work um, using experimental data. So that's lab based experimental data collected primarily in our um, uh, cognitive science of disadvantage work. Uh, Cameron Parcell, another CI from University of Queensland will be undertaking some ethnographic work in particular communities. We'll be continuing to use survey data and administrative data, um, but with Commonwealth Bank of Australia, we'll be looking at transactional data. Simon Smith's work will bring in some of the biosocial data from actigraphy and uh, spatial data will, will allow us to do the place-based work. So we're bringing in a lot of new data sources that move beyond traditional social science surveys um, into the new centre. Uh, next slide, thanks. In the new centre, in the current centre, we had 10 chief investigators. The new centre will have 15, so we've expanded quite a lot. Um, uh, there are five continuing chief investigators and 10 new chief investigators coming into the, the new centre. Um, I'll be continuing to, do, to direct the centre. Deb Cobb-Clark um, will be continuing and Deb will be our deputy director. Karen Thorpe will be continuing. Matt Sanders will be continuing. But I think everybody else um, is, is new to the Life Course Centre. Um, and we'll be, we'll be leading um, uh, some of the new work. Um, we're very multidisciplinary. Um, uh, Helen Wong um, we, is a data scientist who will be coming in from ITEE here at UQ. Uh, Brendan Gleeson from Melbourne, Geography and Urban Planning. Um, Nick Glosier from Sydney, Psychiatry and Epidemiology. So expanding out quite a bit beyond the social science disciplines um, uh, that we have in the current centre. Uh, next slide, thanks. Um, of course, alongside each of the chief investigators sits a whole team of researchers. And this is a photo taken on the left from our research retreat in Perth a couple of years ago, and on the right from one of our 
data for policy um, get togethers in Canberra. We look forward to the days when we can actually physically meet again and have these retreats. Um, uh, COVID-19 has meant that a lot of our planning is now done remotely and over Zoom, which has brought some challenges, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, but I, I think the other thing that we're particularly proud of in the new centre is that in addition to our government partners, we've managed to bring in both um, business and philanthropy. So we have partnered with Commonwealth Bank of Australia, Good Start Early Learning, which is Australia's largest childcare provider, so there are two current business partners. We've also partnered with the Mindaroo Foundation, one of Australia's largest philanthropic organisations, in addition to government departments at all levels, national, um, Commonwealth, state and local council. So we've really broadened out our um, group of partners um, as well in the new centre. Uh, next slide, thanks. I think it's interesting, um, and I'm nearly finished, uh, just to look across the universities at where, um, at our nodes, I think it is interesting, and we can reflect on this later, that each of the nodes are primarily based in a research institute. So University of Queensland, we're primarily based, although not solely in the Institute for Social Science Research. Our researchers at UWA are from the Telethon Kids Institute, at Melbourne, they're from the Melbourne Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research. And at University of Sydney, um, the Brain and Mind Institute, as well as the School of Economics. So I think that um, we are very um, lucky to have such strong research institutes sitting behind us. And they've been very important um, in helping us to build the current centre uh, and the new centre. So just to, to wrap up, uh, next slide, thanks, Emily. Um, we'll be continuing to focus on a life course approach, um, looking at people, places and opportunities. We're continuing to try to break the cycle of disadvantage and look at the transitions, the disruptors, uh, disruptors and exposures. So um, we'll be continuing to take that approach um, next slide, thanks. But we're already starting to look beyond the next seven years. So we're very grateful to the ARC for funding us again. Um, but we know we can't rely on ARC funding forever. Um, so we're already with our advisory committee trying to build our vision for life course futures, um, which will take us beyond the centre of excellence um, seven years into a, a 10 year outlook where we can continue to embed um, the life course approach um, into um, policies and programs um, to support and reduce disadvantage going forward. We're not exactly sure what life course futures will look like and this is one of our key tasks going forward to build this framework so that we can put the Life Course Centre on a secure platform going forward so that it will continue well beyond um, the current chief investigators um, into the future. So next slide, thank you. So I hope that's given you a bit of a taste for what we've done and where we're going. We'd be very keen um, to have those of you who are interested and aligned with our research um, getting involved. If you want to find out more about the centre, have a look at our, our website. There are ways that you can join up um, and receive our newsletters. You can become research affiliates. Um, you can attend our events. Um, we're particularly keen to reach out to students and postdocs who might want to, to join with us. So, so please take a look at the, the website and email the Life Course Centre. Um, with any questions or queries that you have. So I think I'm right on time. Um, thank you very much for listening and I hope there are some questions and comments. So thank you very much, Janine. Um, so we have um, an opportunity now for some questions. There are already some that have come through uh, the Q&A uh, to us, but I'd encourage you if you've got questions, just submit them through the um, Q&A 
button at the, um, at the bottom of your screen and we will try uh, to get to as many of them as we can. So Ginny, just to start, um, we've, we've had a, a couple of questions uh, that are related um, around gender. And, and so one, one, of the, some, one of the participants has asked whether in the current Life Course Centre or the future Life Course Centre, um, there's been much of a focus on gender-based disadvantage. It wasn't something that you specifically mentioned in the, um, the at-risk slide in the presentation. Um, and we also have a related question um, about whether you could say something about gender differences in disadvantage, particularly amongst young adults, um, and potentially, for example, single mums versus men of similar age, or or whatever you might think about, it, it might be relevant. So, so we might might start with those two questions. Okay, thank you. Thanks. That's great questions. Um, yes, there has been a strong focus on gender. Um, that's an area that I've been interested in um, throughout my career and I've done a lot of work looking at uh, gender differences in time spent on unpaid work and the impact of that um, on women's access to um, opportunities outside the family and employment. So yes, if you go to um, the website, you'll see there's quite a few papers that we've published um, with my colleague Paco Perales and others we've looked at um, not only um, gender differences in time spent on work, um, unpaid work, but we've also looked at differences um, across the life course in how gender attitudes um, develop and change. Um, and some of the work that we've done has looked at the important impact of parenthood on men's and women's gender attitudes. And one of the surprising things that we found uh, is that when men and women become parents for the first time, they both develop much more traditional attitudes about gender roles and who should take care of young children. Um, we've, we've done quite a bit of work on that area, trying to understand what it is about um, structural features of Australian society that means that they may, um, they may develop those attitudes. Uh, with Leah Rupana, uh, one of our affiliates, our associate investigators at Melbourne. We've also done a lot of work looking at gender uh, and time pressure um, and, and health outcomes as a result of parenthood. So there's been a very strong focus on gender inequality. Um, I think um, going forward, it will continue to be a focus. And again, I think with the impact of COVID-19, some of the early results that we're seeing around what's happening to young men and women um, in terms of their employment and their opportunities as a result of COVID-19 is really raising concerns for us about um, gender inequality going forward. And, and we are concerned that COVID-19 may, may lead to a setback um, in some of the gains that we've made around gender inequality. And, and I'm particularly interested in trying to understand how we can address gender inequality, not by focusing on women and asking women to be more like men and follow a male life course, but focus on gender rather than women and focus on the structural constraints that lead to gender inequality. Um, so that's a, an area of research that I hope to um, develop more. In terms of young people, um, I can't think just off the top of my head of specific work that we've done around young uh, men and women and gender differences, but there'll certainly, I think, be a focus on it going forward as a result of COVID-19, because what we are seeing, I think, is that young women in particular who um, tend to dominate the hospitality um, areas um, and retail are really suffering quite heavily as a result of COVID-19. So that will likely be a focus for us going forward. Thank you. Um, we've had another question come in um, and, and so uh, we have a participant asking whether the research highlights any key differences for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders or refugees or children from cul culturally and linguistically diverse environments. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. So the, um, the work around Indigenous disadvantage has been largely led by our colleagues at University of Western Australia. 
Um, so they have undertaken um, a longitudinal survey of Indigenous children and they're in the process of linking that to um, West Australian um, administrative data. So there's been quite a, a big focus in the West Australian node on that research. Um, there's also been some research led by our colleagues at Sydney looking at the outcomes of some of the um, trials in the Northern Territory um, um, around welfare payments. Um, so there has been um, a focus across some of our nodes. Going forward, some of the place-based research that we will do in the new centre, one of the communities that we plan to focus on will be um, an Indigenous community in Western Australia. And I can see that that will be a stronger focus going forward in some of that ethnographic work. Um, in terms of refugees, um, we haven't focused a great deal on refugees. A couple of our PhD students are looking at um, work on um, employment outcomes for um, uh, ethnic groups coming to Australia. We've done a couple of papers looking at the um, uh, longitudinal survey of refugees and humanitarian migrants um, in Australia. And I've done a paper using that data where we've found that pathways into Australia through the humanitarian um, uh, uh, intake has a significant impact on health outcomes. So um, there's been a little bit of work done on that. Um, Again, going forward, there may be um, uh, new projects that develop over time, um, looking at some uh, further research on refugees. At the moment, we don't have specific projects um, uh, planned in that area, but um, certainly refugees and, and migrants are one of the social groups that are more likely um, to experience disadvantage. So it's quite likely that there will be further research that explores explores that social group further. Thank you. Um, so, so another question, Janine, you've talked a little bit about the fact that the, um, uh, the role of the centre is to um, try to also address disadvantage um, as well as simply do research about it. And you've talked about the fact that you're partnering um, with uh, governments and um, service delivery organisations and, and will be partnering um, with business in the future. Can you say a little bit about how the Life Course Centre works with partners um, to, to try to develop solutions to um, deep disadvantage? Um, yes, so um, we have quite a range of um, partners. And as I said, in the new centre, we'll be expanding our partnership network. How, how do we work with them? Well, um, when we wrote the uh, two proposals back in 2014 and the most recent one. Um, leading up to the development of that grant, we had several meetings with key partners such as the Department of Social Services, um, our new partner Commonwealth Bank of Australia, Good Start Early Learning, and we talked to them about areas that we were interested in and we got their feedback on what they would like to, to work on. Um, and in some cases, we've done some early um, pilot work with them. So the grant applications already outline a couple of projects that we're planning to do with them. Um, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, for example, that work will be led out of University of Melbourne. And they're partnering with us to really look at how we can build um, financial capability. So what um, what can we understand by looking at financial transactions and how people use credit cards and their financial decisions? What can we learn from that about what is needed by specific groups in terms of building financial well-being? And that research is already underway um, and we've already had early meetings with CBA and we'll continue to meet with them. So. So there will be projects like that that are already designed and underway and developing. Uh, going forward, what we will do, um, we will hold uh, what we call partner summits at least once a year. Um, we have representatives from our partners on our advisory committee. So as new opportunities arise um, and as new 
issues emerge, and again, COVID-19 will be a major issue affecting a lot of our partners, um, we'll develop new projects and those partners will come to us with ideas or questions um, and we will um, work out how we can work most effectively with them. In the case of Good Start Early Learning, uh, they came to us with um, their wealth of administrative data based on the records of their 7,000, or maybe it's 70,000 um, children and families, and asked us how we could help them develop that data in a way that they could use it for research. So um, again, it's work that we've already started um, here, um, led by Karen Thorpe and her team, where we're looking at their data and basically doing data management um, and trying to clean up and access, um, you know, improve the data sets so that um, Good Start can use the data to work out um, what they need to do to provide the best resources for their children and families. So, so it's a it's a partnership that um, um, is ongoing and develops over time. And some of those partnerships go back a long way, and some of them will be new ones um, that emerge as we go forward. Thank you. Um, the the Q&A is taking off, but we have time. I'm going to take one final question, um, uh, given the time. So, uh, so we have a question here about whether the Life Course Centre has a proactive approach to creating employment opportunities um, for researchers and professional staff who have a non-traditional career pathway, uh, perhaps as a result of disruption or disadvantage or hardship. Um, or also, is there a, a sort of a, um, a role for uh, staff with diverse cultural backgrounds? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, again, a great question. So we certainly do um, do what we can to um, ensure that when people's um, employment with the centre comes to an end, that they move on to, to further employment. Um, I didn't talk about this at all, but um, we have a number of portfolios across the centre for um, areas that we are developing. One of these is the capacity building portfolio, um, currently led by Kane Polidano, one of our associate investigators at Melbourne. Um, the capacity building portfolio is charged uh, with developing the capacity of everybody involved in the centre and beyond. So the capacity building portfolio designs um, professional development training for um, staff and students. And we hold professional development weeks um, for staff and students um, every year. Um, we look for professional development opportunities for our professional staff. and. Again, I haven't spoken about this, but the centre is underpinned by a very strong team of professional leaders uh, led by our centre um, Chief Operating Officer, Dr Lucy Mills. Um, uh, we have node administrators at each university uh, and Lucy proactively looks for and encourages all of the professional staff to undertake um, professional development opportunities. Um, we do also try to attract um, people from diverse cultural um, uh, backgrounds. We are a very international centre. And at one point, I think in my team, there was only one um, research fellow from Australia. Um, the others were all from overseas um, backgrounds. Um, we also have schemes that are specifically designed for Indigenous students um, and we do try to work with rel the relevant agencies to attract and um, uh, promote um, people from Indigenous backgrounds. So um, one of the one of the goals of an ARC Centre of Excellence is to achieve gender equity. Well we've certainly achieved gender equity. In fact in order to be gender equal Lucy and I worked out that we would need to sack some women <laughs> Um, we won't do that. Um, so we we argued to the ARC that really um, our goal should not be so much around gender equity, but cultural and ethnic um, uh, diversity. Um, and so that's our goal. 
um, to to achieve that kind of equity um, over the next next seven years. Thank you very much, Janine. Um, so I'd, I'd like to thank you for the presentation. Um, it's been terrific to hear about the Life Course Centre, both what it has been doing over the last seven years and, and what it will do um, in the next seven years and, and further into the future uh, beyond that as well. Um, thank you very much as well to you, our audience, for coming along today. I hope you found this um, interesting and thought provoking. We will be making a recording of this available on the YouTube channel of the Humanities and Social Sciences Faculty of the University of Queensland. So I'd encourage you to look out for it there. Um, I'd also like to mention that uh, the Institute for Social Science Research will be hosting another two events um, this week for Social Sciences Week. So on Thursday, the 10th of September with the School of Social Science here at the University of Queensland, we're hosting a webinar which is entitled Triaging Child Abuse Material Cyber Tips for Investigative Prioritisation. So that is about um, cybercrime cyber and I would um, encourage you to come along to that. And then on Friday, the 11th of September, the Institute will host another webinar entitled Ethical Data Science for Social Impact. Um, and this is part of a new program of work that we have established in the Institute for Social Science Research to use social data science uh, for public benefit. I hope that some of you will be able to join us for one or both of these events. You can find details on the events page uh, for uh, the Institute for Social Science Research. Uh, thank you again very much uh, for coming along today um, and please stay safe during these challenging times. Thanks everyone.